Crazy quilting became popular in the late 1800s. Small, random pieces of fabric were hand-stitched together and then embellished with elaborate embroidery. Now you can fast forward to today and crazy quilting can be totally created using an embroidery machine. Eileen Roche, embroidery expert, has mastered this technique. Welcome back to Sewing with Nancy, Eileen. Nancy, it's great to be here today. If you have scraps of fabric, thread, and an embroidery machine, you can immediately become a crazy quilting expert. Wondering how? All the patches, stitches, and elegant embroidery is programmed right into the designs. This process is extremely gratifying. Today's crazy quilting with your embroidery machine, that's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, making a difference in sewing, quilting, crafting, and needle arts for over 30 years. Amazing designs and Class A needles. Before embarking on today's crazy quilting, Eileen, let's share with our viewers the traditional crazy quilting. And this is a treasure in, in my house made by my great grandmother, Alice Lee Larson. And you can see the date. She was Norwegian, maybe didn't spell August quite right, but, right. but uh, we have a beautiful date. There are silks, twills, cottons, wool, all hand stitched. And I, I just adore some of these crazy Stitches. embroiders. Oh. And she uses a variety of thread. She's actually mm -hmm. using yarn and some cotton. And I imagine if we looked closely, there might be some silk thread in here. Yes. Unfortunately, some of the patches are, have seen their better day. But with that, you can tell that she stitched on a foundation. This was an old damask tablecloth. Tablecloth. Look and at that. And you can see the, the weave of the fabric come through. Mm -hmm. The silk has has, uh, again, is through the test of time, has not quite worn well. It's almost 100 years old. It is. It, it's very precious. Mm -hmm. Her daughter, Viola Larson, in 1973, this piece is dated, made crazy quilting again using the same techniques but with velour scraps. So it's a warm, yes. loving fabric. fabric. And it's not finished, which mm -hmm. allows us to go to the underside and see how it was crazy pieced together. Mm -hmm. Big, unmeasured, you know, just kind of scraps of fabric. Build as you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just kind of fascinating. You can see the variety of foundations. We're pointing out some similarities to yesterday's crazy quilting mm -hmm. and today's crazy quilting, as you'll soon see. And let's just look for look at these. I, you just have to take time to admire some of this work. And even if you're not a hand embroiderer, you can accomplish the same thing. Absolutely. On today's machines, you can mimic this look a lot easier. A lot easier. So we have some small samples to show you that you can dabble in this. You could expand upon it, but. Mm -hmm. Beautiful fabrics. These were silks that were remnants from previous work that um, I had in my stash. So I beautiful colors to coordinate. And of course, the black offsets it just beautifully. And like what you saw earlier, the embroidery, this is done with the machine. And it just is going to do it automatically for you. And even some of the embroideries will show you some options for this. They could be added before mm -hmm. or after. And then even trim or mm -hmm. lace that can be from scraps from your sewing area, or this was created at the broider machine. Mm -hmm. Now here you have silk dupioni. I do. So it's it's a luscious fabric, but you can also use cottons. And here shows a, a, a patchwork block of cottons, mm -hmm. and it's done on a foundation. So let's talk a little bit about this block or the blocks that we have here and, okay. and point out to, to you, if you haven't used an embroidery machine, computerized embroidery machine, you'll see that it's not just for accent embroideries. 
There are these beautiful stitches that embellish each seam, and we have three different versions and with a large variety of stitches, some that have long stitch lengths, mm -hmm. others that are tiny, really beautiful decoration. But it, one thing they all have in common is the very first color that they stitch is this kind of schematic. It's a numbered sequence, and it has outlines that show you exactly where your fabrics are going to go. And on the screen of our sewing machine, you can see that this is one, the first thread color of the embroidery design. It's functional. Right. So I always suggest using a contrasting thread, unless you're doing all light fabrics on top. But, you know, it's easier to see when it's in a darker color. And instead of the foundation being an old tablecloth, this is a traditional embroidery stabilizer. Right. It's a poly mesh cutaway, and this one happens to be fusible, which helps in our flip and sew method. You, you can see the shine of the fusible. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the templates that come with the block so that you know how to stitch, uh, how to cut your fabrics, mm -hmm. how do you prepare those scraps. There's two ways to prepare your templates. You can do what we call window pane or paper doll style where you actually cut right on the outline. Seam allowances have already been included in these, so that's good to know. If you're going to work on maybe a test scrap of embroidery that uh, you have already have in your stash, you would stitch that on regular stabilizer, pop it out of the hoop, and then place that window pane template over it, centering mm -hmm. it, and then you could trace if you wanted trace to. Trace if you wanted, you know, with a removable marker or not, and mm -hmm. then you'll know exactly what size it should be. Now Eileen has pre-cut these five swatches that are patches that are going to go on here, and you can see you don't have to get them exact. Oh no, and actually bigger is better because, mm -hmm. you know, the flip and sew method can be a little tricky, so if, if you leave some room for her, then you won't have uh, that many challenges when it comes time to piece sure. them in the hoop. And you can see mine are really oversized, but that's okay because the scraps that you wind up with after this project are often usable for the next project. So let's go stitch this now. All crazy quilting is enhanced with embroidery, whether it's by machine or by hand, you need to choose your beautiful thread colors. I'm working with rayon thread in a multiple colors, more than this that I'm showing you. And in the bobbin for a computerized embroidery, I'm using bobbin thread recommended by my sewing machine manufacturer. Lightweight, it's not the same weight as the rayon. Make sure you put in a new needle. It's so important. Don't you find, Eileen? Absolutely. You get a fresh start with a brand new needle. So we have our computer, our embroidery units attached to our sewing machine, and you have already stitched one of the designs as we showed you earlier. So I have color one, which has all the numbers and the outlines of the different patches. I'm already on color two, and you can see color two is an outline of my first patch. So it's time to lay that fabric right sides up, over that outline. Lower the presser foot, and I'll keep my hands out of the needle way, <laughs> but I will hold on to that patch just for a moment to get it started. And it looks like I didn't position my patch just right. I have a little corner out of position, but it will be covered by the seam allowance. By the seam allowance, so um, I'll be fine on that patch. It's like paint by number because you have two, three, four, five on that embroidery hoop and you know where to go next. Absolutely, and it's so fun to watch it come alive. So now the needle will advance over to color two. And color two is just another seam and that's going to connect patch one and patch two. So in the hoop, I will position my fabric. now. This time I position it right sides together. And I can lift the uh, fabric beneath to make sure that my edge is going to be caught and lower the presser foot. And again, keeping my hands out of harm's way, <laughs> way out by the perimeter of the hoop. I'll just guide it, the fabric so it can cover mm -hmm. that seam. Now the fun part is next, Nancy. The revealing, un or the unveiling, I right. should say. So we wait till the presser foot lifts and moves to the next line, and then I just finger press that open. And of course, silk is so responsive, it just does flatten right out. So time to take the next patch. 
patch number three. And do you ever tape that down, Eileen? Yes, this would be a great time to tape that down. Thanks, Nancy. So I keep the uh, transparent tape out in the beyond the boundaries of the block, but you know you really can even stitch on on that transparent tape. Sure. No harm at all. So again, I'm lifting my seam allowance to make sure that my new edge is going to cover it, and I think I have this patch upside down. So we'll flip it in this fashion. Okay, lower the presser foot and off we go. So really, it's embroidery at its simplest form, just doing straight stitching to construct this patch. Unlike my great-grandmother, my great-aunt, they did it freeform on their damask tablecloth. This is done easily, and you'll have just the same patch look, mm -hmm. patch after patch. That's right. Now, if you'd like to, you could do some trimming of that mm -hmm. seam allowance. We're just going to expedite a little bit by mm -hmm. you can see how fast this goes. And I will tape this section down again mm -hmm. out in the seam allowance. And that's just a little bit of insurance. Now I have quite a bit of excess fabric here. So I think it will take a moment to trim this patch away okay. and reveal, you know, the area underneath, which is number four. And just right sides together, aligning that raw edge. And again, it's, it's always wise to lift it if you're working with skimpy mm -hmm. pattern section, fabric sections, you can even flip this back and make sure you're going to cover the area that you need to cover. Sure. And once you're confident, flip it back, and align that raw edge, and lower the presser foot, and off we go. This is fun. It is really, you know, building a block by numbers, sure. just as you said earlier. And while this is finished stitching, we'll take a break and do this off camera. Now that I have patch four applied and flipped back and even taped down, it's time to add my decorative corner. This is an embellishment we've already done on a piece of fabric. So I want to make sure that it's going to fit in the area and lower the presser foot and go. And I, again, I'll just kind of hold on to that so it doesn't shimmy across the hoop. Now even that though that embroidery had a little stabilizer on it, it's just fine to add. Oh sure. It's very lightweight and it won't no harm. No harm, no foul. <laughs> so the pieces are cut larger. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a process and it you get a rhythm to this after a while. You do get a rhythm rhythm to this. Okay. And then we'll just flip this back and reveal the beautiful fabrics underneath. Now I'm going to take a moment and tape that down um, so that it won't get caught as we do the decorative stitches. Just bear with me one second. And while Eileen's getting this ready, the next stitches will be, as we mentioned, these beautiful decorative stitches that were done by hand traditionally and now are done by machine. Big, wide, lovely stitches that would be hard, kind of hard to do if you had to do them by hand. So right. you're ready to do the stitching. Mm -hmm. Now often when you're working on the decorative stitches, you are stitching over maybe a light fabric and a dark fabric. Mm -hmm. So color choice, it can be uh, a little difficult. So always select fa colors that are gonna pop. The whole idea about crazy quil quilting is that the stitches are visible. Exactly. And a lot of times crazy quilting in a hoop may be just with fabric. This time it's fabric with embroidery, with decorative stitches, and big decorative stitches. Right. This is a technique that more is better. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's just kind of fun to just watch what happens. And each decorative stitch is a different color segment. So you can add colors, you know, seven different colors if you'd like throughout the block. So we'll just take a time to have all these stitches stitch out each time. You can change a thread color as you can see here. And now we'll show, our next we'll show how to personalize, just as my great grandmother did. Eileen finished stitching all the decorative embroideries, the decorative stitches on her block. This is a different block, of course. But now to add some personalization, a date, a monogram, just to give it that same traditional look, but in a modern way. Let me show you how. I'm going to add the monogram in, with built-in lettering on my machine. 
and I'll select a script because I think that goes with the style. I most certainly don't need that extra large, so I'll go down to a medium size and touch set and then sewing. Now because this is a built-in design, I don't know exactly how to place it. So at the, in the block, I'm going to use a target sticker that just has a crosshair with an arrow pointing on one end, and that's designating the top of the embroidery design, in this case, the top of the letter E. So on the editing feature of the machine, I'll use the jog keys to move the hoop so that I am centered right over that target sticker. And I have to rotate my design because, you know, I want to fit that E sure. in that space. So I'm going to use a little tool that uh, will designate, it tell me exactly how many degrees to rotate the design. And I position it centered over the target sticker. I just want to make sure that the edge is parallel with the hoop. And I swing the dial so that the red crosshair sits on top of the crosshair underneath. And it tells me to rotate 344 degrees. So I'll go into rotate and I will rotate 340. Oh, you know, and I'm too close to the edge, so we'll do that first out here. And we just do it by tens, and we'll get right to 340. And then when I move back to my target sticker, I'm able to stitch the design. Lower the presser foot, remove the target sticker, and embroider. That's how easy it is to personalize a quilt block. Mm -hmm. In another little patch, I could add a date if this was maybe a sure. memento for a wedding mm -hmm. or uh, and some special occasion in a family. And, and just let it stitch. Dude, so many options are built right into embroidery machines today. You have lots of different lettering. And uh, of course, with the different colors of thread, you can, the sky's the limit on your creativity. <laughs> really, it's beautiful. Now we've used all silk fabrics, and while this is kind of stitching, I'm just going to show you that you certainly could use cotton fabrics, and this is what this block is made out of. And you can see the traditional cotton fabrics, not quite as shiny. And then you could also consider using cotton thread rather than rayon thread. So the choice is, you know, depending upon the flatness of the fabric, you may want to use the flat cotton type thread and look at those are beautiful just even on the tonal look I, I like that look a lot. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing some more embroidering but while this is stitching we'll, I'll just talk about when you're embroidering in a hoop and creating a block the last stitch always happens to show or some of the last stitches will give you a cutting line and a stitching line so every block will be exact. If you remember from my great aunt's blocks, they weren't always alike. So here, they can always be alike because you're going to be trimming along the outer edge, stitching, let's see if we can show you, on the inner edge of this. So you have exact lines to do the trim, and that's what I've done here. So no matter what, if this is your first time piecing a quilt, you're going to have it exact. If this is the, your first time embroidering, you're going to have it exact because it's a, this is a great transitional technique. And then when you go to piece, you actually just sew on that inner line. That's your seam line. So you don't have to be concerned about the seam allowance. So many, many embroidery in the hoop projects have those exact stitching lines. So the E is coming to a close, isn't it? Yes, it's just about done. So once it's complete, I want to add some decorative flowers in another patch. And here you can use the traditional template. And in just in closing, Eileen, if you can show, if you're familiar with embroidery, you know about templates and you can just kind of show where that is. So a template is a printed image of your embroidery design that really any software that you have, you just go to file, print, and you can also stitch them out, but it's easiest to use software. It has an arrowhead designating the top of the embroidery design, and then you just position it in the area where you mm -hmm. want the design to stitch out. If it's square to the hoop, you wouldn't have to rotate it, but if not, you could use a, a tool to determine how many degrees to rotate the design. So you can see personalization is very evident and very possible with crazy quilting.
Sewing and quilting are very personal crafts. So is the business of creating with needle and thread. Please welcome Stephanie Struckman via Skype, who has made the art of sewing her business, a business within her home. Great to see you again, Stephanie. You too, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, I, I'm glad to interview you and tell our viewers your business experience of setting up a sewing studio, a, a, a learning lab within your home. When did you start, Stephanie? I started five years ago. Um, I started teaching sewing lessons probably six or seven years ago uh -huh. when um, I worked for a, a small sewing machine shop and uh, one of the managers suggested that I, I start teaching and I took her up on it right away. And um, then the machine shop probably within a year or two um, announced that they were closing. And um, they were very grateful to allow me to email their uh, community oh. group that they had kind of built up. So I'm um, just letting people know that I still want to teach sewing classes. And if anybody was interested, please let me know. And so I started an email list and I told them I was getting married and I was graduating and um, <laughs> I still wanted to teach sewing lessons. And so I talked to um, my then fiance um, about doing that after we got married. And he said, yeah, definitely. And so um, as they were closing, I purchased a couple of student machines and sure. um, just yeah, we talked about originally it was in one room mm -hmm. and just wasn't working out. It was right in front when people walked in the door and I kind of wanted, you know, the house to be more homey. Sure. So mm -hmm. I talked him into moving it into our kind of it's our, our living room with a fireplace in it. <laughs> well, I, I, I like the uh, the fireplace as a thread rack. That's very clever yeah. of you. Yeah. Yeah. It was a nice flat space to kind of keep it out of the way and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, make it pretty. <laughs> so how many machines do you have set up in your sewing studio? Um, I have three main ones. I try to keep my classes, if it's not a private lesson, um, sure. try to keep them to two to four students. Uh, the classroom I originally had it in could fit six students. So I had about six machines that I could kind of rotate mm -hmm. through. Um, but then I kind of decided six students, six to eight students sometimes is a little bit more difficult, especially when it's children. And so we decided to move it um, into the other room. And so I try to keep classes from two to four students, so it's a little bit smaller. And you have some interesting categories that you teach to. You mentioned young girls or young boys learning to sew, but you have some yeah. other combos of or other options for teaching. Yeah, definitely. Uh, get a broad range of people. Um, yeah, I, I like the kids' classes. I start from seven and up, and sometimes the parents decide whether seven is too young. Uh -huh. um, but I've had some really great sewers at seven. And then I've had a lot of moms and daughters, which can be a really fun bonding experience for mm -hmm. them um, and for me to get to know them and their relationships. Um, and then a lot of a lot of women, just friends that want to get out and do something, um, or, or young moms that want to sew things for their kids or, or home deck. Sure. Well, that's a, quite a variety. And if if someone was starting thinking about starting a sewing business within their home, what what would be your top two recommendations or suggestions to them to give them business advice? Uh, I think just to make sure that you have a good spot that you can really call. Um, I don't want to say home, but kind of, you know, home for your business that yes. can be comfortable. Um, you definitely, when you're bringing students, especially kids, into your home, you definitely want to make sure that it's comfortable and that the parents feel comfortable leaving their kids there. And even, I even have a spot that if parents want to stick around while their kids are in class, they mm -hmm. can kind of sit there and read a book or check, you know, email or whatever. Sure. Well, what a great idea. And what's the biggest challenge you've had over the years of teaching sewing within your home or having your home business? You know, I would say the biggest challenge and something I kind of touched on earlier was uh, classes that are too big, especially huh. when it's kids. You know, when it's adults, um, adults can be more patient if you're helping other students and they need help, but they can also look over the shoulder of someone else and be like, oh, okay, that's what I need to do. Um, whereas children, um, if you have a classroom of six to eight new sewers that don't oh, know what wow. they're doing, um, mm -hmm. can be really overwhelming unless they really pick up on it. But you hate to leave somebody behind who actually is, you know, doing a really good job and understands, but, 
you know, they're waiting for other people who need help. And that might be a situation in a lot of classrooms <laughs> in less general. Is, in other words, less is best for beginner yes. sewers. Yeah, I like the two to four. It's a good number. Well, Stephanie, thanks for the advice. Good luck as you Thank continue you. to teach sewing to a variety of ages. And thanks. good to see you. Thank you. You too. Always good to see you. <laughs> Well, thanks to Stephanie. If you'd like to re-watch this interview, you can go to nancyzeman.com, watch the show, the interview, or 80-plus programs. And this wraps up our first program of today's Crazy Quilting with Your Embroidery Machine with Eileen Roche. See you next time. Bye for now. Eileen Roche has written the book Today's Crazy Quilting with Your Embroidery Machine, which serves as a reference for this two-part series. The book includes a CD with three crazy quilt blocks, three in the hoop projects, and 12 accent designs. It's $29.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2821. Order item number BK00126. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at nancyseaman.com to see additional episodes, Nancy's blog, and more. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs and Class A Needles, Closed Captioning Funding provided by Pellon. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.